Gin and Trouble, a Mafia Romantic Comedy, Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, Book 5, written by Catherine M. Hurst, narrated by Virginia Rose and Aaron Shedlock. Chapter 1, Dante Shaking hands, check. Twitchy eyes, check. Inability to sit still, follow a football game, or think of anything but her? Check, check, and double freaking check. That's it. I'm addicted to Julia. Or maybe I need to learn to meditate. Hmm. I wonder if Julia meditates. Earth to Dante. My brother Gabe plopped down beside me on the oversized couch. Dude, what the hell is wrong with you? The Saints just got a first down. It's Thanksgiving. After dinner naps are mandatory. Ignoring him and the rest of my family gathered in the den to watch the game, I lean my head back and close my eyes. I wonder if Julia is taking a nap. In bed. Naked. Nice try, but you can't claim turkey coma this year. We barely touched it. He glanced toward the kitchen, likely to make sure his wife wasn't listening. I'm ready for a pizza. That Chinese food wore off about ten minutes after we cleared the table. Maggie will murder you in your sleep if you order more takeout. I felt bad for him. Hell, I felt bad for all of us, but mostly I felt bad for Maggie. Nah, she loves me too much to knock me off. He raised his chin, but the crinkle between his eyes told me he had his doubts. Maybe or maybe she doesn't want to raise five kids on her own. I couldn't resist giving him a hard time. As the baby of the family, it was my job. True, but you have to admit, nothing, and I mean nothing, spoils Thanksgiving more than an overcooked turkey. I dropped my voice to a conspirator's tone. Her soggy oyster dressing is a close second. As if the memory was too much to bear, he shuddered. There's pie. I couldn't imagine how Maggie could have screwed up putting a frozen dessert in the oven, but where there's a will, is it edible? Only one way to find out. I followed Gabe to the kitchen, but when he turned to face me, his serious expression told me I'd been lured away from the rest of the family under false pretenses. What's up? This year is, it doesn't feel like Thanksgiving. He leaned against the counter and gave me his best concerned big brother look. You okay? My chest tightened to the point I struggled to breathe. I'm fine. Ma's and Cicely taking care of Pops. They'd be here if they could. They aren't the only ones missing. Gabe was as subtle as an air horn. Our parents' absence wasn't the only sour topping on the shit-flavored pie. We'd seen them over Christmas. Our older brother Joe was another story. Grief washed over me like storm surge from a Cat 5 hurricane. But I tried to play it cool by changing the subject to yet another brother. Marco would be here, but he's busy running one-fifth of the business. He's running the business. Gabe's voice rose to the point he glanced back toward the family room as if to make sure no one had overheard him. Right. I got it. I did. We didn't use words like mafia or mob or the Cosa Nostra in mixed company. But I didn't want to get into murders and orphan kids and the black hole in my heart. Gabe got that far away expression we all had when thinking about Joe. I can't believe it's been three years. It's bullshit what they say about time healing all wounds. I clamped a hand on his shoulder and put my face in his line of vision. Are you sure you are okay? I'd be better with some pizza. He laughed a humorless laugh that told me he'd lied, or at least said the right thing for my benefit. I'll deny I ever said this, but me too. I'm freaking starving. Chuckling, Gabe turned his attention back to the game. A split second later, he darted toward the TV. Run, go, 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 yes, touchdown, saints. A chorus of who dats erupted from my other brothers, their wives, and their kids. We might have been born in Sicily, but we'd lived in the Big Easy since we were in grade school. Needless to say, we bled black and gold when the New Orleans Saints played. Normally, I'd be shouting along with them, but not this year. Gabe was right. This Thanksgiving sucked. My only hope of salvaging the day was Julia, a woman I'd technically never met, but had spent the last several months gaming with online. Speaking of which, what better time to ask her out than a holiday? I pulled out my phone and fired off a text. Me. Happy Thanksgiving. Julia. You too. How was it? Me. My sister-in-law's turkey was so dry it turned to powder in my mouth. Julia. It couldn't have been that bad. Me. Jerky has more moisture. I doubt any of us will recover from the T-Day trauma in this lifetime. Julia. LOL. 
Did anyone eat it? Me. We tried. Five minutes in, my brother gave up and ordered Chinese. Julia. Dry turkey and Chinese is better than the cereal I had. Plus, you were with your family. That has to count for something, right? Smooth. Real smooth. Complaining when the only family she has nearby is her pain in the ass sister. I slipped outside and called her. Hi. Hearing her voice sent a shock of electricity from my ear to my toes and back again. Parts of me softened, but other parts hardened. Are you busy? No. Nope. Do you have plans tonight? I hadn't been so nervous about asking a woman out since middle school. Besides a sci-fi channel marathon and splurging on a shrimp po' boy? Julia's laughter gave me a shot of courage. Want some company? The fact that my voice cracked like my teenage nephews should have made me run for the bayou, but I dug the way she made me feel. I dug the slightly nauseous, too excited to turn back, next in line for the roller coaster craziness of a new relationship. I dug her. It's Thanksgiving. You should spend it with your family. Her words had a sing-song quality to them that told me she was smiling. She's going to say yes this time. I know it. I've been here since 10 this morning. You know what they say about too much of a good thing. Families are like sunshine. They'll burn you if you get too much. She sounded like she'd bit back more laughter. Not a bad analogy. I'm an introvert in a house full of loud Italians. I usually spend the day after family dinners nursing a too many people hangover. Do you drink raw egg, tomato, and pickle juice smoothies? Eggs, no, but a Bloody Mary and some dill shooters work wonders. I love that she had the same slightly off sense of humor as me. I loved damn near everything about her, except the part where she'd gone out of her way to avoid meeting me. I'll take your word for it. So what do you think? Want a sci-fi and chill? I hated how desperate I sounded, but I was more than ready to meet her. Hell, I hadn't even seen her pick. I had no clue what she'd look like and didn't care. I just wanted to be with her. The line went as silent as the freaking grave. Shit, shit, shit. Julia drew a deep breath. I don't know, Danny. My stomach turned for an entirely different reason than bad turkey or asking her out nerves. I'd lied to her for months about my name, and any other tidbit that would have linked me to my family. New Orleans was a big city, but in a lot of ways, it was as small a town as Mayberry, only with more booze and beads and boobs. A Sicilian family did not simply waltz in and buy half the French Quarter without creating a few million rumors. In the South, rich plus Italian equaled the mafia. In our case, the stories were true, or they had been until about a year ago. I can't, Julia lowered her voice. My sister's here. I'm not sure she's up for company, and I hate to leave her alone on a holiday. That's cool. I get it. I spent a fair amount of time belly aching about my big fat Italian family, but in reality, I wouldn't trade them for the world. I don't know what she heard in my voice, but she sighed. It's not that I don't want to see you. Hey, it's okay. I'd feel the same way if it were just me and my brother. Memories of Joe threatened to pull me under again. It has to be hard without your older brother there. Julia had spoken so softly I wasn't sure if the words had come from her or my imagination. I'm okay. I hadn't completely lied. That she knew exactly what was wrong without my having to explain meant the world to me. Besides, the last thing I wanted to do was to drown her in my grief. Again. It won't help. The only thing that can is Sofia Abruzzo paying for his murder. When she spoke again, the humor had returned to her voice. This is weird, but I was watching a movie earlier. Before they ate their turkey, the characters took turns saying what they were most thankful for. It was cute, but totally unrealistic. Sweet, but cheesy. I had no idea where she was going with this, but she had my attention. Exactly. So I thought with us being us, we should change it up a bit. A rustling sound came over the line as if she'd changed positions. Let's share two things we're thankful for, and one thing we'd be thankful to get rid of. Ideas rose to the surface of my brain like bubbles and champagne. You first. This year, I'm thankful for my job, and you. And just like that, my black grief cloud lifted. I feel the same way about you. And my job, but mostly you. I'd like to banish beige, dry turkey from all future holiday meals. She snorted, choked, and alternated between coughing and laughing. My smile widened. Soda shot out your nose, didn't it? No comment. Julia pulled herself together enough to ask, was the turkey really beige? More like grayish with undertones of grain. 
I deadpanned. What about you? What's the one thing you'd like to leave behind? I was thinking... Her coy tone made my pulse race. Yeah? I'd like to get rid of the mystery in our relationship. My heart grew three sizes and threatened to burst from my chest. A little mystery is a good thing. So you don't want to meet me? Babe, you have no idea how much I want to meet you. She made a little gasping sound that went straight to my cock. I love it when you call me babe. You sure? It's not too sexist for you? I couldn't help but tease her. While I agreed with her 100%, she'd made her feelings about gender equality known, often and loudly. It is, and I'm probably setting women's rights back 50 years, but it sounds incredibly sexy when you say it. Julia sighed the sort of sighs that made me think of daydreams and cotton candy. Right, so, as I was saying, the comic book and gaming convention is this weekend. How would you feel about meeting there? Like I'd died and gone to geek heaven. That could work. I played it cool, but I couldn't have thought of a more perfect first date. Julie and I had met online while playing the same video game. We shared a love for Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and all things superhero. Except Daredevil, obviously. What better place to meet than the epitome of geekdom? Great, I'm working the con, but I'm off Saturday night. Working? As far as I knew, she had a job in cybersecurity. Another thing we had in common. Don't laugh. I'm crossing my heart and hovering my finger over the mute button, just in case. She sucked in a breath. I'll be spending 48 hours or so dressed as sexy Darth Vader for a local comic book shop. Holy shit. I'd expected her to say she was working a merch booth or the food court for a little extra holiday spending money, but this, wow. I'd seen my fair share of cosplay girls, and let me tell you, they were stunning. Sexy Vader, huh? I know, I know. It goes against everything I believe in. I mean, I hate how women are objectified in sci-fi and fantasy, but Christmas is right around the corner. I could use the extra cash. You don't need to explain. I get it. And I agree. Women are absolutely objectified in the comic and gaming world. But, but, she laughed, likely knowing full well where my brain had gone. I struggled to come up with a tactful way of asking her about her looks. In the end, I decided it didn't matter. I was coming dangerously close to falling for her based on her heart and her sense of humor and her brilliant freaking mind. If the outside was as beautiful as her inside, bonus. If not, it wouldn't change how I felt about her. But are you sure you're ready to meet me? Absolutely. A plan began to form. A freaking awesome plan involving VIP tickets to the masked ball. The event had been sold out for months, but for once in my life, I was glad to be a Marchione. One phone call, and I'd be a step closer to giving Julia the best first date in the history of first dates. Chapter 2 Frankie Tonight was my date with Danny. After so many months of talking online and on the phone, I knew him better than I'd known any of the jerks I'd actually dated in college. Without the physical stuff to get in the way, we'd formed an incredible bond. Why am I so nervous? What can possibly go wrong? My mind immediately went to my growing list of horrific scenarios. He'd pick his nose, or boss me around, or take one look at me and leave. Get a grip, Frankie. He's amazing. Don't pass out or puke on him, and everything will be fine. What the hell are you wearing? Sophia, my oldest sister, stormed into our bedroom. Is that the costume for the con? I thought we had the night off. She knew darned well why I was dressed as Harley Quinn. I'd told her about my date with Danny a hundred times. However, I didn't have time to argue. Once Sophia got started, she'd go on and on. We're off tonight. I'm going to the masked ball, remember? I drew a tiny black heart on my cheekbone then lined my blood-red lips with a thick black line. With the video game, nerd, you're still going. Sophia gave me a look that reminded me far too much of our mother. The proper term is geek, and yes, I'm still meeting him. Makeup finished, I picked up my phone to order a rideshare. 
No way in the world would I take public transportation to the hotel while dressed in black and red pleather pants and a bustier. Not so fast. She snatched the cell from my hand and held it high over my head, like she'd done with my favorite doll when we were kids. What do you know about this guy? No sense wrestling her for the phone. She stood almost a foot taller. I planted my hands on my hips and glared. Give it back. I'm a grown woman capable of making my own decisions. She didn't move. I'll hand it over once you answer my questions. Have you run a background check on him? How do you know he's not a serial killer? I thought we were fighting to break free of Tommaso so we can date and marry who we want. I reached for the cell, but she angled her body away from me. You're acting just like our mob boss brother. Now you're talking marriage? Sophia might have pretended to ignore the insult, but I'd caught the flash of anger in her eyes. Damn it, Soph, stop twisting my words. At the end of my patience and out of time, I lunged for the phone. She tossed the cell at me. I don't like it. A quick glance at the clock sent my pulse racing. Pulling up the rideshare app, I said, I'm meeting him in a public place and I have an ironclad escape plan if it doesn't work out. I have to work first thing in the morning. What's the point of dating? We're not staying in New Orleans. We'd been over this several times since I'd made the mistake of telling her about Danny, and I didn't have the energy to get into it again. I hurried to the closet for my boots. We're going to a party, not running away to join the circus together. Who ever heard of a masked ball at a gaming convention? Sophia wrinkled her nose as if she'd smelled something foul. It's New Orleans. We don't need a reason to dress up in costumes and get drunk. I'd tried to lighten the mood, but judging by her icy expression, I'd failed. This is not who you are. She grabbed my arm, pulled me across the room, and turned me to face the mirror. You see a young woman excited to go on a date with a guy. I see a mafia princess risking too much for nothing. I jerked free. I'm not a mafia anything. I agreed to help you bring Tommaso down because I have no intention of being sold to the highest bidder. After our father died unexpectedly, our brother had set the wheels in motion to marry me and my sisters off to men he owed favors to, wanted favors from, or who'd paid the highest price. Sophia and I had escaped to the United States, but our sisters weren't so lucky. They'd gone into hiding in Sicily. Sophia cocked her head and studied me, as if seeing me for the first time. You're stronger than I give you credit for. Thank you. I hated arguing with her, but it seemed like that's all we'd done lately. No surprise, we couldn't have been more different. All I wanted was a computer, a quiet life, and my family back to normal. Sophia's ultimate goal was to unseat my brother as capo and take his position. Something that couldn't happen unless she suddenly sprouted a penis. Old world rules sucked, and the mafia was as old world as it came. But I still think this evening is a bad idea. She would never admit she was wrong. That would be too much like acknowledging weakness. I've been risking my life for months trying to find dirt on the Marchionis. Don't I deserve to have some fun? I nudged her side. She threw up her hands like the Italian she was with serious gusto. Yes, yes, fine, go. Just don't screw around and fall for this guy. The new plan will work, and we'll be out of here. Like it's going to be so easy to waltz into a company Christmas party and steal Enzo Marchioni's DNA. I hope you're right. I checked the ETA of my rideshare. The car will be here in five minutes. I'm always right. Enzo is our half-brother and heir to the Abruzzo throne. Even if he is, there's no guarantee he'll help us, especially if he finds out that I've been working at his family's corporation under an alias and hacking into their computer networks. He'll help because he knows what it's like to be forced into an arranged marriage. She sounded so convinced it would have been easy to believe her 
but I'd learned a thing or two about the Marchionis over the previous year. They rarely, if ever, behaved as expected. Then our problems will be solved. In the meantime, I have a date. My phone chimed with an incoming message. I opened the window and froze. Danny, I need your address. Me, I'll meet you there. Danny, you sure? It's a date. Shouldn't I pick you up? Me, absolutely sure. Meet me by the entrance. He replied with a photo. The goofball had dressed as the Joker, which we'd planned. However, he'd either colored his hair or was wearing a green wig. Making matters worse, he had on more makeup than I did. Part of me was disappointed I couldn't see his face. Sophia glanced at the screen and groaned. That's him? Yep. How are you supposed to know if he's handsome or hideous? He didn't even show you his body. Physical appearances don't matter. Sophia kept talking, but I tuned her out. I needed to think of something clever to text Danny, but came up blank. In the end, I settled for sending him a quick selfie. Or Quasimodo with a tiny dick. Believe me, it'll matter when he wants to have sex and there's a pepperoncini waiting for you. She demonstrated her point with her pinky finger. I grinned, thankful I'd missed most of her lecture. I don't need to worry if he has a tiny pepper penis or a salami. I'm going to a ball, not playing with his. The mention of sex with Danny made me dizzy, but I pushed those thoughts out of my mind. I didn't really care what he looked like. It was enough to finally meet the man behind the curtain. The man that made me smile even on my worst days. Sophia sighed. Uh-huh, remember, orgasms are like truth serum. Don't screw up and tell him your real name. I've been pretending to be Julia Carpenter at the Marchioni Corporation for months without a single slip. I'm not going to blow it. I understood her fears. I even understood her frustration. It went against Sophia's nature to sit on the sidelines while I put myself in danger. She would have been the one working behind enemy lines, but she didn't know squat about computer programs, let alone how to hack them. Not to mention, the Marchionis would have recognized her the second she walked through the door. They believed she'd murdered the heir to their throne, Joe Jr., which she hadn't. However, she absolutely had tried to poison their entire family at Gabe Marchionis' engagement party. Although that sort of wasn't her fault. Sort of. Sophia, beautiful, ruthless, and gullible. Not to mention she had the luck of a black cat standing under a ladder. In short, she'd partnered up with Pietro Lazio, the capo of another mafia family, to bring down the Marchionis. When his schemes had failed, Sophia had taken more than her fair share of the blame for his shady activities. As a result, my entire family had been punished. It was up to me to clear the Abruzzo name, get rid of our brother, and save my sisters. So far, my efforts had worked as well as concrete water wings. But failure wasn't an option. Ah, the life of a mob princess. Never a dull moment. I grabbed my tiny crossbody bag and headed for the door to wait for my driver. Oh, wait, Sophia rushed toward the bathroom. You're forgetting something. Mentally, I ran through my checklist. Lipstick, phone, fake ID, fake debit card to an account under my fake name. She returned and pressed a stack of condoms into my palm. These are extra large. If he's packing a baby gherkin, skip the sex or they might fall off. Thanks, Soph. That's some great sisterly advice. And to think, I'd envied Danny and his big close-knit family. Chapter three, Dante. I leaned against the hotel wall to engage one of my favorite pastimes, people watching. The crowd attending the masked ball did not disappoint. Sure, some had shown up in store-bought costumes, but most had gone all out for the event. 
Not surprising, considering most New Orleans have at least one Mardi Gras costume in the back of their closets. I tip my head to a Victorian-era vampire couple in powdered wigs and enough silk to make a parachute. Ironically, the couple following them were dressed as Blade and, well, Bladeette? Bladeina? What is the technical term for a half-human, half-vamp female vampire slayer? I couldn't remember the last time I'd gone to a swanky event that hadn't been thrown by my parents. I'd certainly never spent almost a thousand dollars a ticket to attend the ball connected to a gaming convention. As a general rule, cons tended to be more about panel discussions, merchandise booths, and photo ops with celebrities. Any parties that popped up usually involved Dungeons and Dragons in someone's room, and the menus consisted of some variation of Doritos and Mountain Dew. A group of women passed by me, all wearing ridiculously tight costumes that left absolutely nothing to the imagination. As if choreographed, they glanced at me, sucked in their non-existent bellies, and tossed their hair over their shoulders. While I was flattered by their once-overs and hungry looks, I wasn't interested. I nodded to the group and did a double take. Upon closer inspection, the costumes weren't skin tight. They were skin. Body paint, to be exact. Only in New Orleans. I glanced back down the street and my breath left my lungs. Julia had sucker punched me from 20 paces in her red and black pleather pants. Sure, they were tight, but not obscenely so. What's more, she'd paired them with a corset-type top, but had thrown a leather biker jacket over it. She was straight up my kind of sexy. I watched her from the shadows like a creeper for several heartbeats. Between her black and red pigtails and her painted on lips, I was a freaking goner. Danny? When her dark eyes finally met mine, her smile blew me away. If I had any doubt in my mind I was falling for this woman, that smile erased it. Nodding, I resisted the urge to square my shoulders and puff out my chest. Instead, I stayed in character and swaggered Joker-like in her direction. Seems like I've been waiting my whole life to meet you. She wiggled her eyebrows and flashed me that damn smile again. Why so serious, Puddin? What do you say we put a smile on that face of yours? And she does Harley Quinn impersonations. She's the perfect freaking woman. Before I could come up with another Joker quote that fit the moment... Julia threw herself into my arms. I can't believe it's really you. As if realizing what she'd done, she pulled back and smoothed my purple tuxedo jacket over my chest. Her eyes widened, but I couldn't tell if her reaction had to do with my pecs or something else going on in that brilliant mind of hers. I snaked an arm around her waist and met her gaze. Don't be nervous, it's just you and me. The same people who've talked or chatted every night for months. Julia glanced up through her lashes. You're not fooling me, Danny. I can feel your heart racing. You're just as nervous as I am. Guilty as sin? Releasing her, I nodded to the door. Shall we? She looped her arm in mine and half dragged me into the hotel. Not surprisingly, Julia took charge from there. In less than ten minutes, we'd flashed our tickets, grabbed drinks from the bar, and managed to find a high top table at the edge of the dance floor. I admired her get shit done attitude. I love people watching. She propped her chin in her hand and stared. Not at the hundred or so other party-goers, at me. People or person? Grinning, I set my Jack and Coke. What can I say? You're easy on the eyes. Julia tapped her lips. But I can't help but wonder what you look like under that makeup. You'll have to wait until our second date to find out. I like the sound of that. Furrowing her brow, she stirred her martini. When she glanced up again, she seemed at a loss for words. That or her nerves were getting the better of her, now that we were sitting still. How's work going? Lame, I know, but if there's one thing that Julia loved to talk about, it's computers, programming, cybersecurity hacking, anything with a CPU had her lighting up like the 4th of freaking July. Except now. The wrinkles between her eyebrows deepened. Honestly, I'm stuck. My AI interface isn't recognizing the visual stimuli properly. I mean, sure, I'm asking a machine to interpret human behavior, but still. I reached up to scratch my jaw, but stopped before I smeared the white face paint. I'd be happy to take a look at it. I mean, I didn't win a hackathon at 15 and earn a free ride to Yale like you, but I know my way around a motherboard. Her cheeks reddened and she glanced away. I'd love a second opinion, but the company I'm working for has ridiculously tight security. Where do you? Let's dance. She grabbed my hand and pulled me off my stool. As a general rule, I hated dancing. Hated it. Other than at my brother's weddings, I hadn't as much as stepped on a dance floor since my mother had made me take ballroom lessons in high school. Come to think of it, that's 
probably where I developed my distaste for getting my groove on. Somehow, the expectant look in her big brown eyes won out over my loathing. Sure. Julia dragged me to the center of the dance floor like a woman on a mission. Or perhaps like Harley Quinn finally putting the Joker in his place. The song playing was some techno remake of an oldie but goodie. It was mid-tempo and easy enough to follow the rhythm, but damn. Every time I made the mistake of watching Julia's hips sway, my blood left my brain for southern regions, and I lost my step. Freaking ballroom? What was Ma thinking? Rather than continue to do my sad sack imitation of the Carlton, I pulled Julia to my chest, placed one hand on the small of her back, and extended her arm with the other. Follow my lead, babe. The gasp that escaped her would have been reward enough. However, the way she widened, then narrowed her eyes as if challenging me, made me feel like a kid with a golden freaking ticket. Bring it on, babe. I had no idea if she could tango, so I started with the standard slow, slow, quick, quick, slow pattern. Julia not only followed my steps perfectly, she added a sexy little hip swirl. Holding her gaze, I ran my hand down her side, leaned in and almost, but not quite, brushed my cheek against hers. She smelled amazing, like ginger and citrus and honey. I couldn't help but wonder if she'd taste the same. Julia responded by kissing my neck before pressing her hands to my chest and giving me a little shove. When I'd taken a half step back, she crooked a finger and beckoned me forward. I freaking hate dancing, but I could learn to love the tango. Once again, I jerked her body to mine. This time, I dipped her backward. The woman didn't miss a beat. She rolled with it, giving me a spectacular view of her breasts. I brought her upright, and she draped her arms around my neck. Meeting my gaze, she slid her thigh between mine and performed pure magic with her hips. What had started as an answer to my lack of popular dance moves had turned into something entirely different. I could feel her body responding to mine, her heat, her quick breaths, her subtle grind. It was only a dance in a crowded room, but it felt like so much more. Unable to wait another second to taste her, I cupped the back of her neck and pressed my lips to hers. Still swaying to the music, Julia pulled back a fraction of an inch, stared into my eyes and raised on tiptoes to kiss me back. The crowd faded away. The music dimmed, lost to the blood surging in my ears. It was just me and her floating on some lust-induced high. I've waited my entire life for someone to kiss me like that. Julia whispered against my neck. Cradling her face, I brushed my thumbs over her cheeks. Funny. I've waited my entire life to kiss someone like that. Chapter 4 Frankie I'm not sure how we ended up in an elevator rising to the top floor, or how my red lipstick had ended up on his collar, or how he had a room key clenched in his hand. All I knew was that I'd never wanted anyone as much as I wanted Danny. Danny what? Had he ever told me his last name? He turned to me. I'm thankful for gaming conventions and the tango. But I'd like to banish slow elevators from existence. Pressing tighter to his side, I whispered, I'm thankful for vacant rooms and getting the courage to meet you. But I'd like to banish clothing. The moment we walked into the suite, Danny swept me into his arms and kissed me. And I don't mean a sweet brush of the lips. Every inch of us from mouths to toes aligned and rubbed together. I came up for air long enough for a case of second thoughts to kick in. I took a step back and asked the first thing that popped into my head. That was one hell of a dance. Where'd you learn to tango? My mother made me and my brothers take lessons. He blushed from his cheeks to the tips of his ears. Mine too. Although I was the one who'd pulled away, the distance between us bothered me. I wrapped my arms around him again. I don't usually do this kind of thing on a first date. Me either. Had I not spent months online getting to know him, I would have called bullshit. No man who looked like Danny had a shortage of female attention. Makeup and chartreuse hair aside, the man was seriously hot. His eyes were a hazily green color that made me think of the sea foam back home along the shore of the Mediterranean. 
His brows told me his curls were normally dark, and the deep V of his white dress shirt more than hinted at his tanned olive complexion. In some ways, he was exactly what I'd expected. I mean, he'd told me about his crazy Italian family. But in others, my God. In others, he was better than I could have dreamed up. Tall, with the broad shoulders and the narrow waist of a swimmer. He was beautiful. Add in his unexpected moves on the dance floor, and I was more than ready to smash my no sex on the first date rule into a million pieces. Not like this was the standard run of the mill first date. We spent more time together online over the past few months than I'd spent with my last boyfriend in a year. Danny brushed his fingertips across my cheek. What are you thinking? That I want you to strip me naked and do everything you told me you wanted to do to me on the phone, in person instead. Whoa there, where did that come from? He flashed me a panty-melting grin and went to work on the buckles and straps holding my bustier together. Bit by bit, my breasts spilled out, but he took his sweet time. This is like unwrapping a gift with too many ribbons. The bustier fell away, and I ran my hands over my bare chest. Are you complaining? No. He half spoke, half grunted, as if seeing my breasts for the first time had turned him into a caveman. I pulled away and trailed my fingertips down the midline of his body. You're overdressed. You're killing me. He shrugged out of his jacket and pulled his button-down shirt over his head so quickly, the fabric tore. Wow, I could have spent hours exploring the peaks and valleys of his chest and abs. However, I had two problems, a lack of willpower and a fear one or the other of us would chicken out. I reached for his belt. He took over and his pants hit the floor, along with his boxer briefs. Before I could enjoy the view, he closed the distance between us. Danny's hands shook as he eased my zipper down. Rather than finishing the job, he nuzzled into my neck and kissed a line from my collarbone to my ear. We have all night, let's slow down and savor this. When he'd practically attacked me the second we'd walked into the penthouse, I figured we'd end up getting busy against the wall. But this was something else entirely. This was a slow and deliberate seduction, and I loved it, and I hated it. But mostly, I needed to not overthink the situation. I'd promised myself I wouldn't get physical with him until he knew my real name. But maybe Sophia was right. Maybe we wouldn't be in New Orleans much longer. Maybe there was no reason to ruin what could end up being our one and only night together. Danny worked his way down my chest, kissing, licking, nibbling each breast before dropping. He took his time sliding my pleather pants and boy shorts down my legs. You're beautiful. Thank you. We stood a foot apart, completely naked. It was an entirely new experience for me. But oddly enough, I didn't feel any of the usual first time with someone new jitters. I knew this man. Maybe not in the cardinal way, not yet. But I knew what made him laugh, what made him choke up, what made him, him. Your beautiful isn't the right word. My cheeks heated, but it's all I can come up with right now. I'm glad I'm not the only one at a loss for words. He laughed softly and gave me a look that would have melted my panties off, if I were wearing any. Why are you looking at me like that? I slid my arms around his neck. Pulling me to his chest, he whispered, I was thinking I am one lucky video game nerd to have met you. I'm the lucky one, you're, before I could say another word, he pressed his lips to mine. Once again, I lost myself in him. The way my body fit against his, the clean, spicy scent of his skin, the fierceness of his kiss, all of it. I wanted all of him, more than just for now. I wanted forever, the one I can't have. The thought left me breathless. 
I could see myself totally falling for him, something I'd never thought would happen to me. He took several steps forward until my back was to the wall. I'll enjoy him, this, us, while it lasts. Hooking my thigh around his waist, I whispered, I want you. Not yet. Once again, he slowed things down by kissing my shoulder, neck, and ear. His teasing had turned me into a needy, wanton mess. I reached for his cock, but he captured my wrists and pulled my arms over my head. Danny, please. Please what? Let me touch you. My words came out on a gasp. Nuzzling my cheek, he whispered, if you touch me right now, it'll be over before it starts. I'm pretty sure I can get you hard again. I'd never, not once, said anything so dirty to a man. I wish I could say I didn't know what had gotten into me, but that would be a lie. It was Danny. Between the months of flirting, phone sex, and over the computer foreplay, this moment felt like a very long time in the making. I like the way you think. His grin reminded me of the Joker, wide, amused, and ridiculously naughty. Wiggling my eyebrows, I laid my favorite Harley Quinn line on him, complete with a heavy Bronx accent. What can I say, Puddin? Every woman has a crazy side that only the right man can bring out. Now you're just playing dirty. He ducked low grabbed my thighs, and hoisted me to his shoulder. I'm a dirty, dirty girl. I squirmed, giggled, and squirmed some more. You're going to drop me. Not if you stop wiggling. He slapped my butt hard enough to get my attention. I bit back a moan and whispered, what's the fun in that? Danny eased me to the bed, pushed forward for a kiss, and didn't stop until he had me pinned to the mattress. Wiggling is much, much more fun in a horizontal position. Agreed. I wrapped myself around him like a vine. No way was I risking him slowing down again. While I loved his lips on my body, I needed more of him. He moved his hips forward, stopped, and muttered, safety first. I'm glad one of us remembers sex ed. Propping myself on my elbows. I watched as he strode back to the pile of clothes on the floor, presumably for his wallet. Danny returned and gave me quite the show. Grinning the sexiest grin of all time, he ripped the foil packet open with his teeth, stroked his cock several times, and finally slid on the condom. By the time he crawled over me, I couldn't form a thought, let alone a sentence. Our bodies aligned. He took a deep breath and pushed forward until he was buried inside me. Holding my gaze, as if afraid I'd vanish like a ghost, Danny whispered, I can't believe you're here with me, like this. Me either. The weight of what we were doing hit me, hard. I wasn't a virgin, and I assumed he wasn't either. But we'd talked about our past relationships, and had both admitted we'd never been in love. But this, at least for me, felt like a first, and that knowledge nearly scared the lust out of me. Danny pulled back and met my gaze. Are you okay? Better than okay. I tugged him closer for a kiss and rocked my hips. Needing to stop thinking and start feeling, I focused on his body moving with mine, his muscles contracting with each thrust, the heat gathering in my core. Danny slid his hand between us and rubbed my clit until he had me gasping and clawing and crying out his name. Within seconds, I came so hard, I saw the entire solar system flash before my eyes. Once I had returned to Earth, he pulled me to his chest, rolled to his back, and positioned me on top of him. I pushed my hips forward and ground out a second orgasm on his pubic bone. Holding me in place, he thrust once, twice, three more times, and followed me over the edge. I'd never experienced anything like it. He had me muttering curses and prayers before it ended. Utterly boneless, I collapsed against him. That was amazing. Amazing is an understatement. He brushed a damp lock of hair from my cheek. 
but now that I know how you like it, round two will blow what we just did out of the water. He was absolutely right about rounds two and three. Or was it four? I'd lost track of the number of times we'd had sex, but at some point, we finally crashed. I hadn't slept so hard in over a year, not since Sophia and I had landed in New Orleans. I woke in a state of absolute bliss, a bliss that turned out to be short-lived. If the sun peeking through the drapes was any indication, I'd overslept. In my defense, I hadn't planned on spending the night, or ending up in a hotel room for that matter. I didn't even know where my phone had landed, let alone set an alarm. My brain was complete mush, but I was certain of three things. One, I was going to be late for work. Two, Sophia was going to strangle me. And three, I was absolutely falling in love with Danny. I eased out from beneath his arm and sat upright. Work, I could deal with. Sophia would give me nonstop crap about not calling, but I could deal with that too. But Danny, what am I going to do? I glanced back at the amazing man and my blood turned to ice. Blinking back what was surely an incredibly cruel illusion, I wiped my eyes and squinted at his makeup free face. Oh my God, I shot out of bed so quickly, I tripped over the sheets and landed on my ass. This isn't happening. Please, Mother Mary in heaven, tell me this isn't happening. I peeked over the edge of the mattress and stared into the eyes of Dante Marchione, the enemy. Julia, are you okay? His voice came out husky and sexy as hell. Hell, just like where I am right now. Try as I might, I couldn't wrap my brain around what had happened. Danny, my Danny, the guy I thought I was falling in love with was Dante Marchione, the youngest son, my family's arch enemies. The same people hell-bent on seeing Sophia's head served on a platinum-plated pike for a murder she hadn't committed, and attempted murders she had. Not only was my sister accused of killing Dante's oldest brother, I was pretty sure my dad had knocked up Dante's mom, which would mean we shared a half-brother, or he could be my half-brother. Oh my God, did I commit incest? What the actual fudge? How can this be? Julia, he peered down at me. I have to go, forcing a smile so wide and fake my cheeks hurt. I scrambled for my clothes. Danny, no, Dante. Freaking Dante Marchione sat up and gave me a look so suggestive, it bypassed my panic and went straight to my core. Get in the shower, I'll call you a cab. And no, shaking my head like a lunatic, I said, I don't have time, I just, I need to go. He climbed out of bed in all of his naked glory. Is this about last night? Every step he took toward me, I took one back until I reached the bathroom. No, nope, not about last night. Dante sighed and pulled on his boxer briefs. Please, tell me what's going on. Nothing, I'm just late for work. I didn't think he knew who I really was. If he did, he would have been on the phone with his brother, Marco, the Marchione Capo, and I would be, what? Tied up like a Thanksgiving turkey waiting to be thrown in the oven? Would Dante hurt me? The Marchionis wouldn't hesitate putting a bullet in Sophia. That much I knew for sure. I have to play it cool. Get the hell out of here and think. He scratched his stubbly jaw. What time are you supposed to be at the convention center? Nine, but I left my costume at home. He motioned to the clock on the nightstand. It's only seven. Right, barely enough time to get home and get into costume. I shoved my legs into my pants. Did my best to wrangle the girls into my bustier and splashed water on my face. I needed to calm the heck down, stat. Sorry, I'm being such a freak, don't worry about it. He stood in the doorway, holding my leather jacket and purse. Are you sure I can't call you a cab? Nope, I'm good. I kissed his cheek and fought hard to hold back my tears. 
If he were anyone else, anyone else in the entire world, I'd have hope. Hope we could somehow find a way to be together, or at the very least, remain friends. But a relationship with Dante Marchioni was the definition of impossible. Chapter 5, Dante A high-pitched wail silenced the room. Not an easy feat considering thousands of people had packed into the convention center. Then again, it wasn't every day you saw sexy Darth Vader giving Spider-Man a wedgie. My balls winced in sympathy pain. Growing up the youngest of six boys, I'd experienced more than my fair share of wedgies, atomic and otherwise. Holy shit, is that her? Zack, my teenage nephew, stared slack-jawed. Good question. She looks taller, but it could be the boots. Unless there are more female Vaders here, that's definitely Julia. The voice-activated Chewbacca sound effect went off as I spoke. All I heard after female was, <coughs> that's <coughs> Julia. The costume had cost me a small fortune. Too damn much for the tech to break down after only a couple of hours. Yes. <coughs> Dude, that noise is going to ruin your game, Zack cracked up. And you're going to need all the game you can get with a girl who looks like that. The kid had a point, but I had a feeling I'd already blown it with Julia. She ghosted me since leaving the hotel. After a dozen or so texts, I decided to find her at the convention. My game was off all right, but it didn't have jack shit to do with the chewy get up. I made my way through the crowd surrounding Vader to get a better look. Her costume consisted of leather straps with blinking LED lights, a cape, and a phallic ish helmet. In other words, she was every sci-fi fan's wet dream, but not mine. That's not her. <laughs> Seriously, Uncle D, take off the stupid Chewbacca mask. Zack continued to stare at the woman. I pulled it off and tucked the Wookiee head under my arm. The fresh air felt good on my sweat-soaked face. How many dominatrix Vaders can there be? He asked. No clue, but she's at least a foot taller, and Julia has bigger... I bit back the thought. Zack was old enough to appreciate breasts, but I felt like a pervert drawing his attention to them. Julia is curvier. Curvier, <laughs> right. He turned to me and shrugged. Maybe she called off sick or is on break? Come on, I have an idea. I headed toward the merchandise booths. Julia had said she was working for a local comic book store. Hopefully someone there would be able to point me in the right direction. I rounded the corner and spotted her standing on a small stage, posing for photos with convention attendees. She's the one in the Boba Fett outfit. He followed my gaze. How can you tell? She's wearing a freaking Mandalorian helmet. I can't even see her hair, let alone her face. It's her. I'd spent a solid eight hours exploring every square inch of Julia's body. I would have recognized her anywhere. Looks like the only way I'll be able to talk to her is to pay for a picture. That line will take forever. Zack held out his hand. Can I borrow your phone for a minute? I handed it to him without thinking. Seeing Julia again had short-circuited my brain. Zack snapped a picture of me, typed, and stared at the phone. Did you text her? Part of me was mortified, but a larger part was impressed he'd potentially found a solution to my dilemma. Yeah, I told her you were here, but she must not ever sell. Julia startled, reached into her bikini top, and pulled out a phone. She stared at the screen for a second, then whipped her head around, likely searching for me. My phone chimed. Zack's perpetual grin widened. She said she'll meet you at the food court in 10. Rather than continuing to stand there like some creeper, I headed toward the smells of grease and grilled meat. Hungry? Yes, I'm freaking starved. Zack flashed me a grin that reminded me so much of his father. I wished I put the mask back on to hide my expression. My brother Joe had taken me to my first gaming convention. He'd passed away before he had the chance to introduce Zack to the wild and weird world of cons. It seemed only right, and so damned wrong that I did the honors. It had been almost three years since Joe and Rebecca, Zack's parents, were murdered. The mob hit, orchestrated by a rival family, had orphaned three children and changed my life forever. Joe had been more than a brother to me. I'd looked up to him like he was a superhero. Sooner or later, Sophia Abruzzo and her entire family will pay. I handed Zack some cash and pointed to an empty table. He shoved the money into his back pocket. Thanks, I'm going to get a pizza. You want anything or are you waiting for Julia? A bottle of water. Zack nodded and walked away. I couldn't figure out what had happened with Julia. 
I'd wanted to meet her in person for months, but had put it off, partly because I was chicken shit, but mostly for her safety. Deep in my bones, I knew, once I stared into her eyes, I'd never want to let her go. And that was an impossibility until I knew for absolute certain my family had broken ties with the mafia. Once I'd worked up the courage to ask her, it had taken me a while to convince Julia to go out with me. The date had hands down been the best night of my life, until she bailed the next morning. Zach handed me a water bottle and plopped down in an empty chair. So what's the plan? We hang out until Julia takes her lunch break, and then you scram. Scram? He smirked. What is this, the 1950s? No one says scram anymore. I was barely 27, but the kid made me feel like a geezer. Doing my best old man imitation, I said, You're going to take the streetcar back to the ferry terminal and catch the boat to Algiers Point, okay, sonny? I miss watching you make a fool of yourself with my future aunt. He took an enormous bite of pizza. No freaking way. Future aunt. I like the sound of that. Yes, freaking way. Not 20 minutes ago, you were worried the chewy noise would ruin my game. No offense, but I don't need a teenage wingman. He lowered his brows. I'm not volunteering to be your wingman, but I'm not missing you taking off that furry rug and prancing. There will be no prancing. Whatever you say. He gave me a dubious look. But I want to see her reaction when you strip. Honestly, I hadn't decided if I had the balls to go through with my plan. It had seemed like such a great idea when I'd first thought of it, showing up in a cosplay costume smaller than the one Julia had to wear for work. It was meant to be a show of solidarity, a leveling of the playing field, if you will. After the way she'd blown me off, I wasn't so sure. I'm not feeling it. Zach gave me the typical teenager smile, the one designed to make adults feel stupid. Not feeling standing up for gender equality or not feeling showing off your six pack in front of all these people. An alert on my phone saved me from answering. I opened the text and my pulse went into hyperdrive. She's on her way. Beat it. Once again, Zach gave me a look that reminded me entirely too much of his father. Folding his arms, he managed to raise his chin and stare down his nose simultaneously. I'll go. If you swear, you'll go through with the original plan. It would have been easy to tell the kid what he wanted to hear and get him the hell out of there, but when Amarcioni gave his word, he meant it. I stood and put the Chewbacca head back on. In the most unadult way as possible, I shook my furry brown ass and flipped Zack the finger. Brrr. Glaring, he gathered his trash, pointed from his eyes to me, and stormed away. I had probably lived to regret teasing him, but I had other things on my mind. Other things like an amazing, funny, smart, drop-dead, gorgeous female Mandalorian walking in my direction. What did you want to talk to me about? Julia glanced around the room, back to me, and narrowed her eyes. You are Danny, aren't you? Danny? Zach laughed from somewhere behind me, but I didn't give a shit. I'd intended to tell Julia my real name on our date, but the night had been going so great, I didn't want to ruin it. Have a grrr. Nice to see grrr this freaking mask. She removed her helmet and sat. My mouth fell open. We'd spent the night together, but I hadn't gotten a good look at her without her Harley Quinn makeup. Between her big brown eyes and the freckles sprinkled across her nose, I was a total goner. Mother Mary, I'm going to marry this woman one day. Rather than saying something stupid and making a fool of myself, I planted my elbow on the table, propped my chin in my hand, and stared shamelessly. Or should I say, Chewy stared shamelessly. Shifting in her chair, she glanced anywhere except at me. Okay, yeah, I could see where a lovesick Wookiee could come off as a little creepy. Sorry, I'm having a... I pulled the head of the costume off and set it on the table. I'm still getting used to the fact it's really you. Julia swallowed hard. I ran my hand across the back of my neck. Is everything all right? You haven't been answering my texts. She opened her mouth as if to speak, but snapped it shut when Zack walked by, clucking like a chicken. I loved all of my nephews and nieces, but he'd always been my favorite. Until then, Julia stared at him and the color drained from her face. I had no idea what was going on with her. First date, sex regrets? Was I not what she'd expected? Did the seemingly random teen's poultry imitation weird her out? I should go. My, um, my boss cut my break short. Her left eye twitched, as if she tried to wink, but it had turned into a wince. No, wait, I have a surprise for you. Panicking, I shot to my feet. You can't go yet. 
Okay. She stared at something or someone behind me and dipped her chin like a starlet, hiding her face from the paparazzi. Freaking Zach, he's probably recording this. I didn't have time to look, nor did I want to assault the miner in front of the woman I was desperately trying to impress. Reaching over my shoulder, I tugged and pulled at the zipper, but the damn thing wouldn't give. Shit, give me a second. I really do have to go. She reached for her helmet. Please, give me two minutes and I'll walk you back to the photo booth. I'd pay for a thousand pictures if it meant spending more time with her. Snickering and clammy hands told me my former favorite nephew had stepped closer. Zach gave the zipper a hard yank, and cold air hit my skin. Here goes nothing. I reached down and unsnapped the fur boot covers, and the back of the costume came loose, exposing me from shoulder to my spandex-covered ass. Beneath the Chewbacca getup, I wore the iconic gold bikini and scarves Princess Leia had worn while enslaved to Jabba the Hutt. Yes, folks, I dressed as the male version of Slave Leia. Julia gasped. And I don't mean in a good way. The poor woman sounded as if she was being strangled. When I finally got the balls to meet her gaze, I wished I hadn't. She wore an expression of sheer horror. Worse still, the people around us had noticed me in all my half-naked glory and whipped out their cameras. Zack, likely sensing my plan had gone horribly wrong, lowered his phone and stepped between me and Julia. This is all my fault. Dante didn't want to do this. I egged him on. She glanced between us as if unsure how to respond. I gave him a shut the hell up look. This is Zach, my nephew. I planned to tell you myself when we met face to face. My first name is Dante. Julia narrowed her eyes. I know who you are. I recognize you yesterday morning. You're Dante Marchioni. Shit, so that's it. She realized I lied to her. I'm sorry, Julia. I planned to tell you last night, but you look really familiar. Zack seemed oblivious to the fact he'd interrupted us. Where do you work? Besides here, I mean. Way to read the room, kid. I can't do this. Please, don't call or text me again. Julia rushed away before I could find the words to stop her. Stunned, speechless, I watched her disappear into the crowd. I'm really sorry, Uncle D. Zack hung his head. It's not your fault, it's mine. Frowning, I nodded to his phone. Did you record that nightmare? Yeah, but I'll delete it. That was harsh. Thanks. I gathered the pieces of the Chewy costume and did my best to ignore the whistles and cat calls from the growing crowd. Zack tugged on the chain hanging from the collar around my neck. We should get the hell out of here. I don't like the way bondage Darth Vader is looking at you. Sure enough, the Amazonian woman stood with one hand on her hip and the other white-knuckling her lightsaber. I couldn't see her face, but... I swore she was shooting death beams at me. Let's go. Chapter 6 Frankie I hit the ladies' room in a blind panic, crashed into a stall, and dropped to my knees. I wasn't sure if I was actually going to vomit or I was in the midst of my first panic attack. Either way, I didn't want to take the chance of having to pay to have puke removed from my costume. Two women came into the bathroom, chatting away. That guy was way too gorgeous to be a gamer. I bet he was an actor. I know, right? That Princess Leia bikini looks just like the one from the movie. Oh my god, did you see his abs? Totes hot, and those green eyes? She sighed a dreamy sort of sigh. The same kind I would have let out if the hot guy were anyone else. Anyone except Dante Marchioni. And that bulge. I almost passed out when his scarves got hung up in his belt. My anger overrode my nausea. I pushed to my feet with every intention of telling these two to go to hell. Except, what business was it of mine if other women checked out Danny's package? Dante's package. Danny didn't exist. He was a pretty lie. A pretty lie told by the enemy. The only reason I'd agreed to meet him was to tell him I knew who he was, and to demand he lose my number. But my heart had gotten in the way of my head. Had his nephew not asked about my job, I might have never worked up the courage to dump Dante. It was no surprise the teenager had recognized me from the office. 
but Dante hadn't. Why would he? I'd worked there for months, and not one of the high and mighty Marchionis had acknowledged my presence. The women continued to gossip. You don't think he stuffed tube socks down there, do you? I say we find out. I wonder if he's into threesomes. The conversation devolved into giggles. What the hell kind of women titter like birds over having sex with a man they don't even know? The kind who've seen an incredibly handsome Italian wearing nothing except knee-high boots, a collar, and a gold bikini with a couple of scarves attached to it. That's who. The bathroom door opened, and the sound of heavy footsteps filled the air, followed by Sophia's commanding voice. Leave, now. The women gasped and whispered, but hurried out. When I'd returned home, Sophia had given me a lecture about staying out all night without bothering to call her. Given the situation with our brother, she had every right to worry. But when she'd started asking about the sex, it had taken all of my willpower not to burst into tears. Needless to say, I hadn't gotten around to telling her Danny was Dante. I hunkered down as one stall door after the next swung open. Sophia reached me and folded her arms. Why the hell was Dante Marchioni making puppy eyes at you? He was my date. My stomach roiled as I hovered over the disgusting public toilet. Danny is Dante. Your date? You slept with a Marchioni? Sophia scowled. I should have told you earlier, but I was a mess. I'm sorry. She didn't say another word. She didn't have to. Her tapping toe said it all. I pulled myself together and eased back from the bowl. I should have warned you as soon as I knew he was here. You think? She smirked. I almost wish the little shit had realized who I was. It would have given me an excuse to kick his ass. I hadn't considered that Dante might show up at the convention, or that he might recognize Sophia. It seemed I hadn't considered a lot of things lately, like the guy I'd fallen for might not be who he said he was. She drew a deep breath. I did warn you it was a bad idea to get involved with anyone. Yep. You told me so. I couldn't believe her. While I knew better than to expect compassion, I didn't appreciate her blaming me for the situation. Sophia pulled me to my feet, lifted my chin, and inspected my makeup. It's a good thing your face is covered for photos. I can't go back out there. The mere thought of facing Danny, no, of facing Dante, made me nauseous all over again. I lurched for the toilet, but she held me upright. You're not going to puke. You're going to wash your face, put that ridiculous helmet back on, and get your ass back to work. Is she insane or just heartless? Both? I shook my head hard enough to pull a muscle. I can't see him right now. He left. Her frown deepened. Not to state the obvious, but the only thing you can't do is see him again, ever. To state the obvious, I know. I mimicked her voice, even though I knew she was right. Heck, I agreed 100%, but hearing the words outside of my own skull hurt. I can't believe you had sex with one of them. Her upper lip curled. Trust me, I'm not happy about it. I mean, in theory, he could be my half brother. The thought made my already queasy stomach go into a full-scale revolt. No, the timing is off. Mama is sure only Enzo is Papa's son. It wouldn't matter if all six of them were secretly Abruzzos by blood. They are Marchionis in every other way. It killed me to lump the man I knew from online in with that bunch of pompous jerks. But I couldn't deny the truth. I'd been raised to hate all things Marchioni including Dante. Whatever feelings I thought I'd had for the guy were nothing more than illusions. They were no more real than the video game we'd played. Or so I told myself. I mean it, Frankie. You can't email or text or play that game. Not a problem. Now that I know who he is, 
I never want to speak to him again. I put as much force into my words as I could, but they still came out soft and uncertain. You're sure he didn't know it was you all of this time? I would have had an easier time of it if he had been playing me. But I refused to lie to myself any more than I already had. No. Who was that kid with him? She guided me to the sink and turned on the water. Zach, Joe's oldest son. The memory of him asking me where I worked sent a chill down my spine. I think he recognized me. Sophia froze. Recognized you or Julia? Julia. Zach's been in and out of the offices with Gabe. I think they're grooming him for an internship or something. I couldn't look at her. I'd screwed up, and we both knew it. That's it. It's over. I've failed. I have to quit. Don't be ridiculous. So what if Julia Carpenter got caught with her hand in the boss's cookie jar? She tapped her fingers to her lips. Yes. Good. This is perfect. Text Dante and explain that you can't continue this thing between the two of you because you work for his family. Nothing about this scenario was good or perfect. But her idea didn't suck. The Marchione Corporation had a policy prohibiting employees from dating their supervisors. While Dante wasn't technically in my direct chain of command, he had developed the company's cybersecurity programs, plus owned one-sixth of the company. No matter how I looked at it, I was Dante's underling. Why? I told you. He thinks I ended things with him because he lied. She gave me her best Cruella de Vil grin. Because we may need his help one day. He can get around a company policy easier than a lie. It's best to let him believe there's hope, just in case. My stomach rebelled at the thought. It was one thing to spend time with Dante while I thought he was someone else. But going out of my way to manipulate him? I couldn't do it. The problem was, once Sophia had an idea, she'd stop at nothing to see it through. Rather than arguing, I remained noncommittal. I need to go home and have a good cry. I kept the last part to myself. Sophia loved me and our sisters fiercely, but she'd never condone me weeping over a man, especially not a man I'd spent the sum total of our relationship with on the computer. Sorry, toots, but you need to pull up your metallic panties and get back to work. We need the money. I knew she was right, but I didn't have it in me. Not today. I'll work overtime this week, or sell a kidney. Her expression softened. Frankie, I know you're hurting, but think about Mia, Valentina, and Ari. They're counting on us. Our sisters were more than counting on us. They were in hiding and dependent on our financial support, which was why we both worked multiple jobs, lived in a tiny apartment, and still never had an extra cent to our names. You're right. I'd do what all mob princesses were trained to do. Ignore the carnage, hold my head high, and put one foot in front of the other. Thankfully, the remainder of the day went by in a blur of grabby hands, flashbulbs, and uncharacteristically encouraging words from Sophia. By the time we made it home, I needed a shower, a glass of wine, and a bed, in that order. Text Dante, Sophia called over her shoulder before hurrying into our only bathroom. I'd been too busy at the con, or in a state of shock-induced denial, to think about what I wanted to say to him. Nor had I checked my messages. Dante. That didn't go as planned. Call me. Dante. Please. Dante. I'm sorry I lied about my name. Give me a chance to explain. I cringed. If he knew even a small fraction of the truth about me, He'd never want to speak to me again. Dante, talk to me, Julia. Dante, it was the bikini, wasn't it? Probably not the best wardrobe choice. Dante, I'm still me, the guy who's crazy about you. Oh, God, why does he have to be so sweet? 
I typed and retyped the text, refusing to cry over a stinking marchione. I wiped my eyes and forced myself to reply. Me, it's over. Please respect my wishes. Dante, let me call you. I knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I needed to stop all communications with him. Unfortunately, Dante disagreed. The more he texted, the more I hurt. Sophia's idea popped into my head. While I refused to entertain the idea of stringing him along, I could use the employer-employee relationship as another excuse to get him to back off. Me. This can't happen between us. I work for your family's company. Dante. You do? Me. Yes. Dante. Wait a sec. You're developing the AI software for the Marchione Corp? Me. Yes, and I can't lose my job. Dante, that will never happen. Shit, Sophia was right. Me, can't take the chance. Dante, we'll figure this out. I hated the conversation and my stupid broken heart and being born in Abruzzo. Most of all, I hated that I'd followed my sister's advice and played with his heart. Me, nothing to figure out. I'm not interested. Please don't text or call me again. Dante, don't do this. I blocked his number, opened my dresser drawer, and dropped my phone inside. I didn't want to see it for fear I'd lose my resolve and call him in the middle of the night. As much as it hurt, I could not and would not get involved with a Marchione, no matter how desperate the situation with my family became. Chapter seven, Frankie. By the time Monday morning rolled around, I was completely over Dante Marchione, and denial is a river in Egypt. I arrived at work to find my desk covered with flowers. At least I thought I still had a desk under there somewhere, but I couldn't actually see the gray particle board to be sure. The message on the card was simple, to the point, and felt like a gut punch. J, miss you, D. Iris, my friend and only other female in the IT department, peeked over the top of my cubicle. If those are any indication of how your weekend went, I want details. Frowning, I motioned to the arrangement. They would be if they were wrapped with a black rest in peace ribbon. Ouch, the masked ball was a bust. Iris wrinkled her nose and adjusted her glasses. Was Danny a catfish? Sort of. I didn't have it in me to discuss the horror show that was my weekend. He absolutely wasn't who he said he was. Sorry, Julia. I know you were looking forward to meeting him. Whatever, it's over now. Lesson learned. I glanced around, trying to figure out where to put the flowers. You want these? Hell yes, they're too pretty to end up in the trash. She hurried to my cube, lifted the vase with two hands and marched away. Problem solved. I settled in and threw myself into my work. Officially, I was tasked with developing a security program that used artificial intelligence to detect any irregularities or suspicious activity at any number of Marchione owned properties. So far, my algorithms had performed mediocre at best, but soon they would be able to detect strangers on site, variances in activity, and even medical emergencies. Unofficially, I used my open access to their video surveillance recordings to keep track of their comings and goings, in hopes of discovering proof they were working behind the Cosa Nostra's back. While Sophia was convinced Enzo was our half-brother, I thought it wise to have a plan B. Besides, what would it hurt to put some of our eggs in the blackmail basket? First on my agenda, skimming the security footage from Dante's parents' garden district mansion. Though his father had been in Sicily for over a year, Dante and his brothers popped in and out of the massive house on a regular basis. An instant message notification from human resources popped up on my screen. Adrenaline flooded my bloodstream as I opened the window. 
Did Dante have me fired after he sent me flowers? HR, good morning, Miss Carpenter. It's come to my attention that you may have misunderstood the company policy on employee fraternization. Please see attached for clarification. Why won't he let this go? Sighing, I closed the message and focused on the footage. If he were anyone other than a Marchione, I would have found it sweet that he was looking out for my job. But he wasn't, and I didn't. I fast forwarded through a few hours of empty rooms, but slowed the feed when Dante's mother, Evelyn, walked into her home dragging a roller bag behind her. What's she doing in New Orleans? Last I'd heard, Dante's father wasn't expected to live much longer. In fact, he had around the clock hospice care in Sicily. A few moments later, Dante and Zach greeted Evelyn. I couldn't help but notice Dante's slumped posture and the phone in his hand. A phone he'd checked several times since he'd appeared on camera. I glanced at the timestamp on the footage and checked our text messages from Sunday. My traitorous heart sank. He's waiting for me to respond to his texts. The message on the florist card had stolen my breath, but the lost look on his face cut deep. Nothing could change the fact our families hated each other, but I should have handled things differently. I leaned closer to the screen as he glanced at the cell, dragged his hand over his face, and walked out of view of the camera. A second message blinked in the corner of my screen, but I ignored it. I was far too busy clicking through the other feeds to figure out where he'd gone. My personal cell vibrated with an incoming call. One glance at the screen made my stomach twist. My sister, Mia, rarely phoned. Besides the six hour time difference and the fact she was in hiding, we didn't get along at all. Hi, Mia. I tried to call Sophia, but she didn't answer. She spoke in Italian, a clipped no nonsense Italian that reminded me of the nuns in grade school. She's probably still sleeping. She worked late, I replied in English to protect my cover. Drawing a deep breath, I steadied my nerves. Everything okay? Valentina didn't come home last night. You know Val, she probably met a man. The news didn't thrill me, but it was too soon to panic. Besides, Mia tended to worry, a lot. At nine years old, She'd written a will and planned her funeral because she'd convinced herself she was dying of Ebola. When I'd pointed out she didn't look sick, she'd thrown my favorite stuffed animal off the cliff overlooking the sea. Mia huffed. I need you to take this seriously. I am taking it seriously. And I seriously think it's too early to freak out. You've been in the US too long. Mia loved to rub my nose in my less than Italian ways. To her, all Americans lived in trailer parks, shopped at Walmart, and drank beer straight from the can. I'll speak to Sophia. No, I'll call her myself. She hung up. I love my sisters, I love my sisters. I repeated the mantra several times, but it didn't make me feel better. As much as I hated to admit it, Mia wasn't the only one of my siblings who treated me like I had the plague. I didn't really know them. We'd grown up on different continents. Sophia was the only one I'd spent any time with. And most days, I still had no idea what was going on with her. Sibling drama? Iris rolled her chair into my cube using only her feet. Isn't it always? I'd told her a little more than I probably should have about the situation with my sisters. Iris had immediately jumped to the conclusion that I was from India, or somewhere in the Middle East, where arranged marriages were common. I hadn't corrected her. Are they still in hiding? She leaned closer and lowered her voice. I've been doing some research. I might have found a guy who can get them passports. Thanks, but passports aren't really the problem. I'm sure my brother has men looking for them. In fact, I'd bet my gaming mouse finger he had people looking for me and Sophia, too. 
which was another reason we'd stayed in New Orleans as long as we had. Tommaso would never think to look for us in Marchioni territory. Iris nodded and scooted back toward her cube. I went the Danny Deets at lunch. Maybe at happy hour, I sighed and turned back to my computer. A few moments later, someone cleared their throat behind me. Someone with a deep male voice. Scrambling to minimize the window, I knocked a stack of files onto the floor and sloshed my coffee dangerously close to my keyboard. Whoa there, easy. Dante knelt at the same time I reached for the fallen folders. Our heads collided so hard I felt the jolt in my molars. Damn it, sorry. He stood and rubbed his brow. What are you? The question died on my tongue when I met his gaze. Although dark circles shadowed his eyes, he was simply stunning. The man brought to mind every cheesy romance novel description I'd ever read. Square jaw, Roman nose, chiseled cheekbones, piercing eyes. His full lips should have softened his face. However, they were currently set in a deep frown. Don't fall for it. Satan was beautiful too. You didn't answer your I am. He glanced at my monitor. I busied myself by mopping up the spilled coffee. I was working. Were you watching security footage from my folks' house? It's my job. I'm developing the artificial intelligence system. I hated how unsure I sounded, almost as much as I hated how I couldn't stop staring at him. Staring and remembering him naked. I'd separated the man I'd known as Danny and Dante Marchioni in my mind. Danny was a computer nerd who had a panache for cosplay costumes. Dante, on the other hand, dressed like a douche. He crowded into my cube in his sleek black suit that cost more than most people made in a year. The expensive fabric fit him like an expertly tailored glove. Okay, so he dressed like a GQ cover model billionaire douche. I've seen the early prototypes. Your work is impressive. Dante studied my face. I didn't know you wore glasses. I didn't. The thick frames, mousy blonde hair, and 50s-style makeup belonged to Julia Carpenter, not me. The mud-colored two-sizes-too-big cardigan, beige work pants, and sensible brown shoes were as much a costume as the Harley Quinn pleather or the metal bikini I'd worn at the gaming convention. He scratched his jaw. You weren't wearing them over the weekend. Contacts. I turned my attention back to my computer and prayed he'd get the hint and buzz off. Julia, I'm really busy. I made the mistake of looking into his stupid green eyes and froze. Holding my gaze, Dante leaned into my personal space, removed my glasses, and lifted my chin. The gesture felt so intimate, I thought he might kiss me. The very idea left me breathless, needy, and completely at war with myself. He was a Marchioni. The people determined to ruin my family. Do you need an ice pack? Dante stepped back. For my lady parts, maybe. What? You have a goose egg. I thought. He pointed to his brow and then mine, before waving his hand as if to erase his words. Never mind. Enemy or not, I felt bad for him. His expression reminded me of a kid who'd lost their best friend. In a way, maybe he had. Maybe we both had. I'm sorry I freaked out at the hotel and the convention. My mouth had gotten away from my brain. I should have left well enough alone and told him to go away, but I couldn't. Even if he was annoying and annoyingly handsome, he hadn't asked to be born into his family any more than I had mine. We were both victims of circumstance. A frown tugged at the corners of his lips before he smoothed his expression. Because you realized you worked for my family? Yes, I could have handled things differently, but I panicked. Dante nodded to my computer. Did you receive the fraternization policy from human resources? Oh, shoot, 
I walked right into that one. I didn't read it. I don't have to. It's a personal rule of mine. I had a situation with a former employer and won't do that again. I caught myself babbling lies and snapped my mouth shut. I can respect learning from past mistakes. He planted his hands on the arms of my chair and leaned close again. I eased back as far as possible, even though every fiber of my being wanted to lean in. Good. Then you'll also respect my wishes and not call or text. Still in my personal space, he lowered his voice. Have I called or sent a text since you told me not to? My heart beat so fast, I wondered if he could hear it. No, but the flowers and this visit. You didn't tell me not to stop by or send flowers. Dante moved so close his cheek brushed mine, which you seem to have given away. A small gasp from the neighboring cubicle told me Iris was eavesdropping. And I doubted she was the only one. The Marchionis owned the company, the building, and half of the French Quarter. They didn't drop by to chat with lowly IT staff. Please don't do any of those things. Don't IM me or call or invite me to chat. His cologne reminded me of fresh cut lumber and exotic spices and sex. Intoxicating. So much so, I turned my face toward his neck and breathed him in before I realized what I was doing. He tensed, but remained close, too close. Did you just sniff me? Maybe. I'd greatly underestimated him and was in serious trouble. You smell good, but that doesn't change anything. I can't get involved with you. Dante's lips brushed my ear as he whispered, Julia. We've spent the previous six months telling each other our deepest, darkest secrets. And don't even get me started on what happened between a Saturday night. We're already involved. That snapped me out of my Dante-induced fog. I planted my hands on his incredibly solid chest and pushed him back. Actually, you're nothing like the guy you pretended to be online. How so? Danny wouldn't send a gigantic bouquet to impress me, or wear a custom-tailored Tom Ford suit, or be all. I waved my hands in his direction like a lunatic, seductive. Dante gave me a sad smile and dipped his chin. No, but he'd show up to a gaming convention wearing a gold bikini so you didn't feel vulnerable and exposed alone. I turned my head and bit my lip to keep it from quivering. He crouched and put his gorgeous face in my line of vision. You have to know it's still me under this damned suit. The only thing I lied to you about was my name. Everything else, my hopes and dreams and fears, was true. I nodded, but couldn't bring myself to look at him. I'll back off the flirting, but please don't cut me out of your life. He swallowed hard. You're the only person on the planet who knows the real me. He's digging his way deeper into my heart, one whispered word at a time. How can something that feels so right have the potential to hurt so many people, myself included? I ached to touch him, but I didn't dare. You're like the opposite of Superman. Dante winced as if I'd insulted him. You pretend to be a superhero to the world, but deep down, you're really Clark Kent. His eyes brightened. See, that's exactly what I mean. You know me, and I know you. Had he stopped with me knowing him, I might have given in and thrown myself into his arms. But once again, he didn't, and I couldn't. The truth was, he didn't know me at all. Dante cupped my cheek. Julia, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to date you. But I'm willing to put that aside for now. I don't want to lose our friendship. If only I could pretend he wasn't a Marchione and I wasn't an Abruzzo. Pretend we were a couple of strangers enjoying late night chats and marathon gaming sessions. But that was absolutely impossible. 
Better to rip off the Band-Aid fast than to torture myself with what-ifs. I don't know what he saw in my expression, but he pressed his finger to my lips. Don't say it. I get it. You're scared. But you should know I'm loyal to a fault. I'm not giving up on us. I didn't know whether I wanted to bite him or suck his finger into my mouth. Maybe not anytime soon, but someday, I promise you, we're going to end up together. He kissed my cheek, stood, and walked away. Too stunned to speak or move or think, all I could do was stare after him. Iris peeked into my cubicle and sighed the same dreamy sigh as the women in the bathroom had after seeing Dante dressed as slave Leia. That was, fanning herself, she whispered. I think I got knocked up by osmosis. Did I hear that right? Danny is really Dante. Yes. I didn't bother to deny it. She'd likely overheard our entire conversation. That's not a catfish. That's an anti-catfish. I mean, most people would lie to make themselves more like a Marchione. Dante isn't most people. Chapter 8, Dante. A few days into my mission to win Julia over to the dark side, I had an idea. Not like wearing a bikini to a gaming convention or filling her cubicle with flowers. This idea was brilliant and gave me a legit excuse to be in the same room with her. All I had to do was show up at the same party and sweep her off of her feet. However, before I could do that, I needed to make sure she was attending said party, convince her to talk to me, eat a few dozen crow, and charm the hell out of her. Easy as hacking into the Pentagon. Saturday morning, I strolled into Marchione Corp's headquarters and went straight to our special event coordinator's office. Whiteboards with color-coordinated lists and post-its covered the walls. The woman's organization skills made Marie Kondo look like an amateur. On a hunch, I walked to the red and green board in hopes of finding a clue of where she kept the employee Christmas party guest list. What are you doing in here? Leo stood in the doorway with his arms folded. I hitched a shoulder and told a half-truth. Making sure we're all set for the party tonight? You? Same shit, different day. He continued to stare me down, though I had no freaking idea why. I wasn't surprised to see him there on a weekend. We'd all worked our asses off to stay afloat since Marco had officially gotten us out of the mob. Leo had struggled, both financially and personally, after we'd gone legit. He'd always been annoyingly serious, but after the transition, he'd become an outright asshole. Leo narrowed his eyes. You shouldn't be in here. Chill, it's not like I'm going through her personal things. I'm looking for tonight's guest list. I snagged a candy cane striped folder from the desk and flipped through the contents. Why? You never attend company functions. He walked farther into the office and inspected the light blue-themed board. I'm thinking I'll make an appearance this year. Skimming the guest list, I noted Julia's name and her lack of a plus one. I'm more than making an appearance. I'll be there with jingle bells on. I'd stayed true to my word. I hadn't texted or called or stopped by Julie's cubicle since she'd asked me not to. However, I'd exploited every freaking loophole in the history of loopholes. Leo said, I take it this has to do with the woman you've been trying to impress all week. I grinned before I could stop myself. What makes you think there's a woman involved? Besides that goofy, lovesick expression on your face? He sat on the edge of the desk. Gabe's pissed you've been paying Zach to stalk her online. It's not stalking. I'm busy and don't have time to sit and wait for her to log on. I asked Zach to let me know if her username happened to pop up while he was playing. Okay, I totally paid the kid to cyberstalk Julia because she'd blocked me. Lame? You bet. But I'd rather follow her character around and kill orcs and stare at my ceiling wondering what she was up to. He nodded. Enzo said you bought lunch for the entire IT department. It's the holidays. I thought it would be nice. To keep from over-explaining, I shifted the topic to our big-mouthed brother. Enzo shouldn't have said anything. It was supposed to be an anonymous gesture. Uh-uh. So, what was the deal with the D's and the cupcakes? Because I wanted a certain someone to know I'd sent them. I rolled my eyes and lied. Enzo screwed up. They were supposed to have M's, as in Marchione. He seemed to struggle to hold back laughter. And the singing telegram? For Pete's sake, is nothing private around here? How the hell did you find out about that? You should know, nothing is sacred in this family. 
Leo hitched a shoulder. By Friday, I'd run out of ideas and sent her a singing telegram for her birthday, even though she'd been born in June, not December. Needless to say, it hadn't gone over well, but she had sent me a text to inform me I'd gotten the date wrong. Okay, okay, you got me. There's a girl. Leo stared as if he didn't know what to make of my confession. Do you have a problem with that? While I understood his reaction, I didn't like it. Just because I didn't troll the quarter looking for one-nighters and hadn't serial dated my way through college didn't mean I was a freaking monk. Not at all. It's about time. What can I say? I've been holding out for the right woman and Julia is it. Leo nodded to the baby blue board. It's hard to believe Rocco was almost a year old. The color coding made sense after he'd mentioned my youngest nephew's name. Rocco was Gabe's son. Technically, I should say he was his youngest son, since Gabe and Maggie were raising Joe's three children, but I'd never get used to calling Zach, Chloe, or Ryan Gabe's kids. It's crazy. Who would have thought Gabe would make such a good dad? Leo's shoulders slumped. He'd seemed off lately, almost lost. It's weird to think you and I are the last single members of the Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club. Or is it just me now? I'm single for the time being. Personally, I hated the nickname Enzo's wife had given me and my brothers. I never considered myself a bad boy. My brothers, yeah, they'd raised some serious hell and had left a trail of broken hearts in their wake. Me, not so much. Leo scrubbed his hand over his jaw. A little unsolicited advice? Sure, why not? If you have feelings for this woman, tell her. Don't wait and risk her getting away without knowing where you stand. I'll get right on it, if I can get her to speak to me again. That sounds like it came from personal experience. How's Dahlia doing? I haven't seen her around in ages. Now that I thought about it, she'd stopped coming around about the same time Leo had become a workaholic. His frown morphed into a scowl. From what I've read in the papers, she's doing great. Who reads actual newspapers anymore? I grinned and nudged his shoulder. Tired old men, like me. Leo smiled, but it seemed forced. Leo and Dahlia's relationship had never made sense to me. They'd claimed they were just friends for about a decade. But up until a year ago, they'd been inseparable. Anyone with eyes could see they were into each other. Is that what I have to look forward to with Julia? A decade of friendship, denial, and blue balls? By the way, congrats on going viral, Leo smirked. I had zero idea what he was talking about, but judging by his stupid expression, I assumed it wasn't good. Viral? He arched a brow. You haven't seen it? Seen what? He pulled out his cell, tapped the screen, scrolled, tapped the screen again. I had the same queasy feeling that I had every time I went to the dentist. I knew I was in for a world of hurt, but I put my ass in the chair anyway. For crying out loud, either tell me or give me the phone. Ah, here it is. He turned the cell toward me. A video of me stripping out of my Chewbacca costume, complete with a close-up of my golden ass, played on the screen. Adding insult to injury, whoever had filmed it had looped my movements to make it look like I was dancing. Or having a seizure. And of course, the SOB had dubbed in Pony from the Magic Mike soundtrack. Mother of God, I'm going to kill Zack. I couldn't take another second of it, but I couldn't seem to look away. Zack didn't do it. He's in the shot. I snatched the phone from his hand and hit replay. Sure enough, my nephew was standing behind me wearing a shit-eating grin. The person filming changed angles and zoomed in on Julia's face. At the time, I thought her reaction was shocked, maybe mortified, but her expression on the video was something different. She looked heartbroken. Leo held out his hand, but I watched it again. This time, I paused right after the camera zoomed in on Julia. Does she look sad to you? He studied the screen. It's hard to tell. Is this the girl? She looks familiar. You've probably seen her around the building. She works here, remember? I didn't have it in me to tell him the entire story, nor did I want to lecture on dating employees or dating in general. Did you meet her here or somewhere else? We played online video games together for months and met for the first time at the gaming convention. That's different, Leo chuckled. My brothers didn't understand my geek side. To them, the only ring that mattered was the proverbial brass one, and to boldly go where no man had gone before was a euphemism for anal sex or sex with a virgin or both. He made a show of glancing at his watch. I should get back to work. See you tonight. That he planned to attend the party surprised me. You're going? Happy employees stick around. I'd rather suffer through a couple hours of Christmas cheer than replace staff.
Leah ran his hand over his head. Plus, there's alcohol. Truer words. I didn't drink much, nor did I have a staff to worry about replacing, but I'd take his word for it. My job tap danced in the line between legal business dealings and illegal mob activities. As such, I worked solo in a private IT cave that would make Batman jealous. Writing proprietary code, hacking government systems, and ensuring our international computer networks played nice together was far from glamorous. But it allowed me to keep tabs on our competition and our enemies. I followed him to the elevators. Leo pressed the down button, and I pressed up to return to my apartment. What he'd said earlier about being the last two single Marchioni brothers gave me an idea. An idea that had the potential to work out in both our favors. We should catch the Saints game next week. Absolutely. He flashed me the first genuine smile I'd seen from him in months before slipping into the elevator. I didn't understand what had caused the change in his personality over the previous year. But after our conversation, I suspected it had more to do with Dahlia than the Mafia. If I was right and Leo was lonely, a double date could be just the thing to get him back out there. And it just so happens, Julia has a single sister. Chapter 9 Frankie Spit, hair, nail clippings, or blood. I ranked my options in order of preference, with a used water bottle or glass being my first choice and blood a last resort. Sophia flopped onto my bed and stared at the water stains on the ceiling. Or semen. I don't even know him. And besides, he's a married man and possibly our half-brother. I swatted her foot on my way to the closet. A married man who might be the rightful heir to the Abruzzo family and our ticket out of the mafia. Sophia's expression grew serious. This is too important to let your morals get in the way. My mouth hung open. Morals? You're talking about incest? Fine, when you put it like that. Her expression soured. But we're running out of time. Tommaso has Val. Blood whooshed behind my ears. What do you mean he has her? When did you find out? Mia called a couple of hours ago. She keeps in touch with one of the maids at the compound. She sounded as if we were discussing sports stats, bored and mildly annoyed. Is that wise? I thought we all agreed they wouldn't contact anyone. Thinking of Valentina under my brother's control made my stomach hurt. Mia does as she pleases, Sophia shrugged. Tommaso has announced Valentina's engagement to Miguel Salvo. Salvo is twice her age and pulls out his enemy's fingernails as a hobby. She sighed. He's also a member of the Fratellanza and hates the Marchionis almost as much as Tommaso. I didn't have time to process the news, nor did I want to risk having a meltdown before the party. Emotions would have to wait. Regardless, I can get Enzo Marchioni's DNA without resorting to violence or blowjobs. If you can't, I will. She cracked her knuckles like a good little mob enforcer. That won't be necessary. I didn't need her to remind me the situation was critical. Unless we found a way to stop it, our sister would walk down the aisle to a man twice her age and a reputation for getting his jollies on torturing people. Despite what Sophia thought, I could get the DNA without throwing myself at Enzo. I had a plan, a good one. I took a red and green Christmas sweater from the closet and pulled it over my head. I won't be late. I want to be here in case Mia calls. She curled her upper lip. Thank God you aren't planning on seducing him because that is hideous. It's something Julia Carpenter would wear. I missed designer labels and makeup and having more than a $10 bill in my handbag as much as she did. But as long as I lived in New Orleans under the alias Julia Carpenter, IT nerd extraordinaire, I had to dress the part. Not tonight you don't. She pulled her black Versace dress out of a garment bag. Wear this in case you need to enlist Dante's help. It was gorgeous, sexy, and full of bad juju. You wore that to our father's funeral. So, 
what am I supposed to do? Flash him my cleavage and ask him to rip out a chunk of his brother's hair? It didn't matter what I wore for two reasons. I wasn't trying to impress Dante Marchione. And even if I was, he wouldn't be there. I'd checked the guest list. You might want to try something a bit more creative, Sophia scoffed. What do I do if Nicolina is there? The mere thought of our cousin showing up and blowing my cover sent a chill down my spine. Or worse, Evelyn Marchione. Nico is still in Sicily. She stood and perused my pathetic collection of practical, sturdy shoes. And I doubt Evelyn would recognize you. She might. Other than boning our dad back in the day, she hasn't had anything to do with us. Sophia shoved a pair of nude pumps into my arms. Besides, you haven't seen her since you were, what, 14? I frowned at the scuffed up heels. She'd be less likely to recognize me if I dressed more like Julia and less like you. Trust me, the only Marchione you need to worry about tonight is Enzo. She ushered me toward the bathroom. Married or not, he's a man, an Italian man. He's more likely to forgive a beautiful woman who cuts him and steals his blood than a dowdy girl in an oversized sweater and dorky glasses who pulls his hair or steals his glass. I wanted to argue, to point out the million things wrong with what she'd said. But she wouldn't listen, and I was already running late. An hour later, Sophia had curled my hair, applied my makeup, and stuffed me into a cab. I'd never admit it to her, but the dress and the shoes worked wonders. I felt more like me, and less like self-conscious Julia hiding beneath layers of thrift store clothing. I walked into the Christmas party confident I would leave with a piece of Enzo's DNA. And then I locked gazes with Dante. Between his sexy grin and his Santa hat, I couldn't look away. A slow smile crossed his face. He looked me over from head to toe, twice. Logically, I knew he was trouble, but my heart and my body disagreed. I wanted him in ways I'd never wanted another man. Of course, I craved him between the sheets. What red-blooded female wouldn't? But my desire for him went much deeper than sex. I missed our conversations and inside jokes. I longed for a world where we could be a man and a woman in love without our families and lies between us. My current state of mind wasn't entirely my fault. Dante seemed to have made it his mission to make sure he wasn't far from my thoughts. At work, he'd wooed me with handwritten notes, sent the entire department lunch, and embarrassed the hell out of me with a singing telegram. I couldn't even escape him when I got home. He was online every time I logged on, and haunted my dreams every time I slept. Between my racing thoughts and rock-hard nipples, I didn't trust myself around Dante. One touch, and God forbid, one kiss, and I'd never want to leave his side. I needed to find Enzo, do what I had to do, and get the hell out of there. The second Dante turned his head, I ducked into the crowd and followed Enzo. Sipping my wine, I trailed the chef and restaurant owner as he checked on the lavish buffet. I had to hand it to the Marchionis. For a bunch of jerks, they'd spared no expense at the employee party. We need more lobster, Enzo spoke to a woman who appeared to be his assistant, and more toast points for the caviar. Yes, chef, the woman headed for the kitchen. I caught Dante glancing around the room and ducked behind a potted palm. After what felt like an eternity, Enzo lifted a glass of wine from a passing server. He downed half the glass before walking toward the bar. Ten minutes of following him and dodging Dante had yielded nothing except a headache. I'd all but given up when Enzo finally deposited his empty glass on a tray of dirty dishes. This is it. I unzipped my oversized bag and hurried to the edge of the room. With my back to the other guests, I exchanged my glass for Enzo's. There you are. 
Dante flashed me his morning after in the hotel room smile. You're not avoiding me, are you? Damn it, why does he have to be so perfect? Of course I'm avoiding you. I lowered the stemware to my side in the hope he wouldn't notice it. And just in case, I went on the offensive. You lied to me about your name, ignored my very legitimate concern about fraternizing with a supervisor, and went out of your way to make sure I thought about you all week. You thought about me? That's what you took away from everything I said? Using my free hand, I gave him a little shove while attempting to drop the wine glass into my bag. And missed. Dante knelt to pick it up and took his freaking sweet time staring. I could practically feel the heat of his gaze searing me from my feet to the hem of my dress. When he stood, he had the audacity to brush his knuckles across my collarbone. What were you drinking? I'll get you another. I couldn't exactly demand he give me the empty glass without seeming like a complete lunatic, but I needed Enzo's spit. I glanced over the crowd and caught the chef downing a water bottle near the kitchen. Il Duca Rosa Imperiale, I nodded to the far side of the restaurant. They don't have it up front. You'll have to ask for it at the bar near the wine room. I'll be right back. Dante strode off like a man on a quest to slay the dragon of Merlot. Part of me felt bad. I had no idea if Enzo even carried the sparkling red. But I'd bought myself some time with the lie. Rather than standing there watching Dante's ass as he walked away, I wove my way through the crowd to the kitchen, just in time to see Enzo disappear into an office at the end of a hall. I pressed my back to the wall and tried to look normal. What felt like eons later, he emerged without the plastic bottle. Jackpot. Praying the door wasn't locked, I waited for him to walk into the kitchen before hurrying down the hall. It seemed my luck had finally changed when the knob turned in my hand. I slipped inside the office, found the trash can, and sighed. Seriously? Hasn't this guy ever heard of reusable containers? The freaking basket overflowed with plastic bottles. I had no way of knowing for certain all of the empty bottles were his. Figuring the more samples, the better, I shoved three into my bag. Can I help you? Enzo Marchione's voice filled the room. Gasping, I pressed my hand to my chest. Holy smokes, you scared me. Forgive me for startling you, but why are you in my office? Good question. Shit. Not the time to have a brain glitch. I, um, I thought back to Sophia's advice and arched my back to give the girls a little lift. I'm with cybersecurity. I've been having a problem with the camera feeds in this room. I thought I'd check them, you know, since I'm here. Ignoring my breasts, he glanced at the camera mounted near the ceiling. Do you need a stool to stand on? Yes, please, that would be helpful. I smiled, but judging by his weirded out expression, I must have looked like a maniac. Or worse, he thought I was flirting with him. Wait here. Enzo gave me one more confused look, shook his head, and walked out. I sank into one of the leather chairs in front of the desk, but my nerves got the better of me. I stood and wandered to the photos on the credenza. Starting with a wedding picture, I studied Enzo's features. There might have been some resemblance between him and my father, but it was hard to tell. I moved on to a candid shot of the Marchione brothers. It had to be several years old, because it had been taken before Joe was killed. It struck me as odd that while five of the men had their arms draped over each other's shoulders, Enzo stood off to the side. Not only was he apart from his brothers, he seemed alone. I lifted the frame to get a better look and gasped. His eyes, oh my God. He has dad's eyes. That one was taken in Comiso, Sicily, the year before my brother died, Enzo said from the doorway. Embarrassed, I hurried to put the photo back in its place and dropped it. The frame hit the terrazzo floor, shattering the glass. 
Sorry, I'm so sorry. I crouched to clean up the mess. Don't cut yourself. He moved closer. I glanced up and met his gaze. He looked a lot like Dante and the rest of his brothers, but something about his brow ridge reminded me of my dad. The realization he could actually be my brother stunned me. Are you okay? The way his forehead wrinkled left me struggling to breathe. He looked so much like my dad. Memories of the last time I'd seen my father alive flooded me. I had been 14 when my dad sent me and my sisters to different boarding schools. Other than quick holiday visits, I'd stayed away from Sicily until his funeral. I'd missed out on years with my family, with my father, because I'd resented him for sending me away. What I didn't know then was he'd done it to protect me and my sisters from ending up as pawns in a mafia-style chess game. The same game Tommaso was currently playing with our lives. I have to do this. I have to save them. Yes, sorry. I'm fine, just incredibly embarrassed. Still crouching, I carefully sandwiched the broken glass between pieces of wooden frame. Don't be. I snuck up on you. Enzo knelt beside me and helped clean up. His fingers, pointy objects. Forget spit, blood is more accurate. Waiting for the opportune moment to strike, I watched his hands. Julia? Dante glanced from me to Enzo and back. What are you doing in here? Enzo furrowed his brow. There's something wrong with my security camera. She's checking it. It's been bleaking in and out for a week now. I've been meaning to put in a trouble ticket, but I thought, I'm here. I might as well check it out. Uh, hold this. Panicking, I shoved the broken pieces, pointy side out, into Enzo's hands. Hard. Dante said something about wine, but I couldn't hear him over my heartbeat. At first, I thought it hadn't worked. But a split second later, Enzo glanced down at his palms and blinked. Shit. Oh my God, did I cut you? I shot to my feet. Where's the first aid kit? Did you do that on purpose? Enzo looked at me like he thought I was insane. Maybe he wasn't that far off. I certainly felt like I was losing my mind. Why would she do something like that on purpose? Dante grabbed some tissues from the desk. I'm sorry, I'm naturally clumsy, and your brother makes me nervous. I motioned to the blood pooling in his hands. Where do you keep the bandages? He stared as if he couldn't decide if he wanted to laugh or murder me. In the kitchen on the wall beside the walk-in freezer. Stay here, I'll be right back. I hurried for the door. I'll get it. Dante took a step forward, but I waved him off and kept going. Thankfully, the first aid kit was bright red and hanging in plain sight. Ignoring the curious looks from the staff, I grabbed a handful of gauze pads, tape, and antibacterial ointment. I was in such a rush to get back to the man who could very well be my brother. I didn't see Dante in the hall until I bumped into him. What the hell's going on? The sommelier told me they've never carried Il Duca Rosa Imperiale. Not a good time. I held up the first aid supplies, as if they'd explain everything. Dante followed me back into the office. Enzo narrowed his eyes at the two of us before settling his attention on me. I didn't catch your name, and how do you two know each other? Julia Carpenter, Dante and I said together. I snapped my mouth shut. Dante, being Dante, continued. We've known each other for a few months, and I'm doing my damnedest to convince her to go out with me again. Enzo chuckled and held his hands a little higher. You sure that's a good idea? She's dangerous. And Shauna isn't? His laugh tore straight through me. Seeing them joke back and forth made me homesick. Not that my sisters ever goofed around with me like that, but a girl could dream. I'll have you know my wife hasn't stabbed anyone since we've been married. Enzo gave me a pointed look. Unlike some people. Keep it up, and I'll stab you myself. Dante nudged his shoulder. I couldn't help but compare their features. 
they looked a lot alike. So much so that I wondered if I'd imagined Enzo's resemblance to my father. Rather than falling down the is he or isn't he rabbit hole, I ripped open several bandages and took Enzo's hand. Let's get this cleaned up. Chapter 10, Dante. I loved my big, crazy Italian family, in small doses and preferably two or three members at a time. Taking on the entire Marchioni clan at once was chaos. I'm talking the kind of stress that would drive Mother Teresa to drink. I'd arrived at my folks' place a couple hours early to help set up for Rocco's first birthday party. At least, that was what I told myself and anyone else who asked what I was doing there. A lame excuse considering Enzo had brought his catering team and my mother had hired freaking staff to take care of the grunt work. Truth be told, I'd come to pump my brother for information about the incident with Julia. Tell me again. I followed Enzo beneath the party tent and set an enormous tray of animal-shaped sugar cookies on the table. We've been over this a hundred times. You were there. You saw what happened. He ran his unbandaged hand over his lips. She dropped a family photo and stabbed me with the broken glass. Right, but what makes you think she did it on purpose? Nothing about what had happened that night made sense. Besides the wild wine chase she'd sent me on and cutting Enzo's hands, she'd vanished after tending to his wounds. If that wasn't bizarre enough, I hadn't heard a peep from Julia all week. She'd called off sick with the flu on Monday and as of Friday, hadn't returned to work. She hadn't logged into her online game, nor had she opened any of my emails. I'd grown so desperate and sent chicken soup and ginger ale to her home address, only... She didn't live there, not unless she slept behind the counter of a coffee shop. Like I've told you before, she was following me around half the night. I ignored her, but get to the part where she ended up in your office. She was on her knees, cleaning up the glass. She looked up at me and went into some sort of trance. He shrugged. She just checked out. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. He always did have a flair for the dramatic. Uh-huh, go on. When she snapped out of it, she had this crazed look in her eyes. I thought she was coming on to me, you know, giving me the look. I promise you, she wasn't coming on to you. I'd heard it before, and I would bet my left nut I'd hear it again, but I didn't believe it. Were you there when she dropped the frame? Enzo gave me a checkmate grin. No, but everyone knows you're married. He shrugged. Wedding rings work better than oysters for some women. I shoved my hands into my pockets to keep from punching his smug face. This is a waste of time. You want me to finish or have you heard enough? Go on. I motioned for him to continue his tall tale. Next thing I know, you came in and she's slamming the glass shards into my hands. As if to prove his point, he held up his wounded palm. Five stitches and she didn't have a scratch on her, I know. I'd replayed the events over and over, but I still felt like I was missing something. If she cut you on purpose, why did she stick around to help you? Well, if I know, like I said, the woman is a psychopath. Pinching the bridge of my nose, I said, she's a little awkward, not a psychopath. He leaned in and thumped my ear. Then why did she steal a bloody bandage? Here we go again. There's no way she stuffed a bloody gauze pad into her purse. Then explain why there were six wrappers and only five bandages. His tone reminded me of a TV attorney grilling a witness. I'm telling you, she's a serial killer in training, keeping souvenirs of her victims. I couldn't help but wonder if marriage had made his brain go soft. Or maybe he was bored out of his tits and was making up bullshit to add a little adventure to his life. I think the better question is, why did you count them? He glanced around, likely to make sure no one was listening. Bragging rights. What? And he thinks Julia's crazy? I'd lost a lot of blood. I wanted to quantify it. Yep, that settles it. He's gone soft in the head. Marco strolled into the tent. Christ, are we talking about the vampire chick again? I threw my hands up. Why would anyone take a bloody bandage? Maybe she needed my DNA to clone me. Enzo gave us a gallic shrug. Palms up, goofy grin. You know, to make a me that's single. Marco froze and glanced between us. I recognized his expression instantly. He'd either pass gas or he had an idea. You've thought of something, spill it. Frowning, he shook his head. Nah, just wondering what Vampirella looks like. She must be hot to have you acting like a lovesick kid. She's the one from the video, right? Enzo grinned the same know-it-all grin he'd had since we were kids. 
Let me guess. Zack told you? I made a mental note to have a chat with Zack. What happened at the convention stayed at the damned convention, except when it went viral. Leo ratted you out. This freaking family, nothing sacred. Marco glanced between Enzo and me. What are you two knuckleheads talking about? You haven't seen the video? Laughing like a hyena, he pulled his phone from his chef's coat. Our little Dante is famous. Screw you. Not only had some asshat filmed me and put it online, other asshats had followed suit. A half dozen videos and an encyclopedia's worth of memes featuring different parts of my body currently made their way around social media. The Magic Mike song started and Marco cracked up. But halfway through, he stopped laughing and grabbed the phone. He replayed the video, paused, and replayed it again. When he met my gaze, I knew something was wrong. More wrong than my ass immortalized in memes. Marco pointed at the screen. This is Julia? Yeah, you know her or something? She looks familiar. He continued to stare at her image. What did you say her last name was? Zack had said the same thing. Even Leo and Enzo felt like they'd seen her somewhere before. Not surprising, she was hard to miss and harder to forget. Carpenter, she works for us, cybersecurity. She's the one who's working on the AI security program and spends the rest of her day attempting to hack into our systems. Marco nodded without taking his eyes off the screen. To have that kind of access, I assume she's had multiple background checks. Top secret clearance. He was starting to freak me out. Good luck with the future serial killer. Enzo grabbed his phone and walked away. You obviously like this one. What's the scoop? Marco slung his arm over my shoulder. Is she Italian? His quick change in demeanor did nothing to ease my mind. He damn near swallowed his tongue when he got in a look at Julia. Something was up, and I intended to find out what. Does Carpenter sound Italian to you? I stepped back and folded my arms. The scoop is, she doesn't mix business with pleasure, but I'm wearing her down. Laying on the Marchioni charm. Good plan. He nodded. Does she have an accent? What the hell kind of question is that? She grew up in Connecticut. Sometimes she drops her R's like a Bostonian. I'd had enough of the tap dancing. What aren't you telling me? And don't say nothing. Where do you think you know her from? He leaned close and lowered his voice. She looks a lot like Mia Abruzzo. I burst out laughing. Trust me, Julia is a far freaking cry from a mob princess. Yeah. Marco ran his hand over the back of his neck. Again. You're probably right. The mere mention of the Abruzzos made my stomach clench. Any word on when the Fratalanza is going to deal with Sofia? It's been ages, and we still haven't gotten justice for Joe and Rebecca. His shoulders tightened at the mention of our brother and sister-in-law. Justice won't bring them back. No, but seeing Sofia Abruzzo get what she deserves will make me feel better. I could count on one hand the number of people I hated, and Miss Abruzzo was at the top of my list. The sooner she was locked up, or better yet, dead, the sooner my family would feel safe again. Marco frowned. No one's seen her. I thought she was under house arrest on her family's compound. That the woman responsible for ending Joe and Rebecca's lives was God knew where pissed me off on an entirely new level. She may be, but none of the people we have inside the Abruzzo compound have seen her in months. Months? Marco shoved his hands in his pockets. Things have gone to shit since old man Abruzzo died. Junior is auctioning off his sisters to strengthen their power base, or is trying to. After the funeral, they all disappeared. That is, until Valentina showed up out of the blue for her engagement party. TJ always was a heartless son of a bitch. I'd always hated the way single women were treated like a commodity in the mafia. Not that long ago, Nico, Marco's wife, had been in a similar situation. Her father and our mother had demanded she marry Enzo in some bizarre attempt to keep the Marchionis in the Cosa Nostra. Nico and Marco had run off and eloped to prevent that from happening. Unfortunately, marrying Nicolina Lazio had roped him in the mob so tight, not even Houdini could have freed him. Despite the seriousness of the conversation, Marco chuckled. I feel bad for the poor bastard that gets saddled with Sophia. She's easy on the eyes, but knows a hundred and four ways to kill a man with a stiletto. Tell me about it. The mere thought of marrying into that freak show of a family sent a chill down my spine. I had a feeling there was more to the story with the Abruzzos than he was letting on, 
but I doubted he'd share it. Since he'd become capo of the family, there was more going on in his life that he couldn't tell me than what he could. I cocked my head and flashed him a grin. I'd waited months to have this conversation. Can I ask you something without you busting my balls? Oh boy, this sounds like the kind of conversation that needs beer. Marco nodded to the coolers Enzo's staff had set up. I grabbed a couple of cold ones and joined him at a table in the back corner of the lawn. He took a swig inside. What's up? I wanted to ask him if he was happy. If having a wife and a new baby girl made up for everything he'd given up. If he had to do it all over again, if he'd make the same decisions. But I already knew what he'd say. Yes, yes, and hell yes. Instead, I went with what I hoped was vague. How'd you know Nico was the one? I'd been in love with her since we were kids. He gave me a goofy grin that reminded me of the old Marco. The never-take-things-too-seriously guy I considered my best friend. Right, but let's say you didn't grow up with her. How would you know? He downed half his beer. The fact you're asking me that question tells me you already know. But the answer scares the hell out of you. That's just it. I'm not afraid of being with her. I'm afraid she won't give me the chance. I thought the same thing about Nico. Worked my ass off to convince her we were good together. He wiggled his brows. But that's the chase. The real fear starts once you've caught them. Sitting back, I mulled over the little nugget of wisdom. It didn't ring true. Not for me and Julia. We fell for each other over the freaking internet. All I wanted was to have what we had online with her in the same room. Is that too much to ask? So what's stopping you? Good question. She says she had a bad experience with a workplace romancer or some crap. Let me see if I got this straight. He set the empty bottle on the table. You're into her. She's into you. But she won't cross the line because you're her boss? I'm not her boss, but yeah. That's the gist of it. Simple. Fire her or quit. He's a moron. Picking up the label on my bottle, I said, I highly doubt firing her will make her want to ride off into the sunset with me. Then quit. I opened my mouth to remind him half of my job was looking out for his stupid ass, but he interrupted me. I'm not saying stop what you're doing. Sell off your shares of Marchioni Corp and use the cash to start your own security firm. I'll hire you outright. I'm sure our brothers will do the same. Solves the problem with the girl and gets you out from under the family business. He held his arms out wide. A win-win. He had a point. A good one. With my own company, I could hire staff and take on other clients. Or not, and still make enough money to keep myself in the lifestyle I'd enjoyed since birth. I had nothing to lose. If it didn't pan out, my old job would still be there. That could work. My brain spun with possibilities. Pretty much my entire life happened in my family's office building. I worked there, had a condo there, and ate most of my meals at the restaurant on the bottom floor. It'd be good to finally cut the umbilical cord and stand on my own. He sat back with a smug expression as if he thought he were a king on a throne imparting wisdom. You can say it, I'm a genius. More like an idiot savant. They don't use that term anymore, it's offensive, you moron. Har har. I pulled my ringing phone from my pocket, checked the caller ID and sucked in a breath. It was Edward Kincaid, the head of security at Marchioni Corp. Everyone knew not to disturb the family today. Either something had gone to shit, or Julia had finally showed up at the office. Marchioni, sorry to disturb you, but Miss Carpenter logged into her company computer five minutes ago. Remotely or on site? On site, sir. His clipped tone grated on my nerves. Sure, I'd asked him to alert me for personal reasons, but he didn't know that. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Get a visual on her and call me immediately if she leaves the building. Roger that. He disconnected the call. Standing, I finished my beer and winked at Marco. Got a jet. And miss your nephew's first birthday party? I'll be back in time for him to smash his cake. If not, I'll Photoshop myself into the pics and no one will be the wiser. Remember what I said. If you're not scared shitless, it isn't real. He stood and clamped a hand on my shoulder. Just be careful and don't let your dick do the thinking. Thanks, Oprah. Appreciate the sage-like advice. This has been part one of Gin and Trouble, The Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, Book 5. Written by Katherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Aaron Shedlock and Virginia Rose. 
If you enjoyed this audiobook, please subscribe to Catherine's channel where you can find part 2 of Gin and Trouble, along with more of Catherine's paranormal and contemporary romance novels.